Uh, let me just give an endorsement for our Stephen ministry here. We, we have a great team. Pastor Dave and others helped to, to lead that. And if you are in need of a Stephen minister, let me just commend that to you. I think you will truly be blessed. Likewise, if you have gifts and you think you can uh, be used in this way, we really, really, again, encourage you to come out for that workshop on February 23rd. It's going to be awesome that day. Now, if you're just joining us, whether you're here, whether you're online, we are in the middle of a series on the life of Christ. Um, and if you've been sticking with us every week, we've been going through this. We are, we're glad you're still here. Um, this is going to take us all the way up to Easter when we're going to have a resurrection party. It's going to be a great day on Easter, April 21st. Um, now, last week, Jesus showed us what it meant to be a sold-out follower of him, looking primarily at Matthew chapter 10. Today, we're going to see what it means to find true rest in Jesus, looking at the end of chapter 11 and the beginning of chapter 12 of Matthew's gospel. In fact, chapter 11 concludes this way with Jesus' words. He says this, "'Come to me, all who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and lowly in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light.'" Now, after a few chapters of revealing some hard truths to his followers, Jesus ends it all by saying, I'm going to bear your burdens. I'm going to give you rest. And as we hear those words, I wonder if anyone in this room today is in need of some rest. Does anyone here have a weary soul? See, in our crazy, busy world... Many of us are lacking sleep, unable to put down the responsibilities that others lay upon us. Perhaps that busyness has done a number on your soul. And if that is you today, I'd like to take this opportunity to introduce you to the Lord of the Sabbath, the only one with whom we can find true rest. With that in mind, let's pray. Heavenly Father, we come before you Lord, and I don't know the story of everyone who's walked in here today or who's listening online or who's, uh, who's downstairs, Lord, but I, I, I know you do. Father, you know what path we're walking. You know the burdens we're carrying. You know the afflictions we've been, we've been feeling this week. And, and so I pray, Lord, that you, through the power of your Spirit, would come and minister to our hearts. Father, may this message be preached first to, to the preacher himself, Lord, and also to those that are here in this room, Lord. And may we take time to rest in you, Lord Jesus. Teach us how to do that. And we ask that in your precious name. Amen. <clears throat> well, does anyone in this room like Chick-fil-A? Yes, I see those hands. Awesome. Awesome. Well, if you didn't raise your hand, I will be in the back afterwards, and we can uh, talk about why you didn't raise your hand. <laughs> see, back in the 1960s, a man named S. Truett Cathy, the founder of Chick-fil-A, uh, invented the chicken sandwich, literally. I mean, up until that point, apparently no one had thought to put a deliciously mouth-watering piece of fried chicken in between two slices of bread. Why nobody thought of that, I don't know, but this guy did. He made millions, and we have experienced the blessings of heaven on earth. Amen. <laughs> in fact, I am convinced that the marriage supper of the lamb is going to have a chicken deluxe sandwich smothered with Chick-fil-A and sweet and spicy sriracha sauce, waffle fries, and a cookies and cream milkshake. Can I get an amen? amen. Who is hungry? <laughs> well, too bad. Even today, Chick-fil-A is actually closed. You can't go there. It's Sunday. No samples today. <laughs> so Chick-fil-A is closed, but do you know Why? See, every Sunday since it was the first official open in 1967, the store has been closed on Sundays because S. Truett Cathy had been in the restaurant business for many years, and he realized how grueling it can be. If you work in the restaurant business, you know, never a day off, right? S. Truett Cathy was a Christian. He was also a Baptist. But he put his decision to close his store, and it was more than religious, in fact, the company's website puts it this way. It says, he believes that all franchise Chick-fil-A operators and their restaurant employees should have an opportunity to rest, to spend time with their family and friends, and worship if they so choose, or choose to do so, I should say. Now, some of us in this room are thinking and wishing that we worked for Chick-fil-A and not just ate there. But this is an amazing fact. I mean, this man's conviction that his store should be closed on Sunday had to be so strong 
Because imagine how much money he was putting on the table by foregoing being opened only six days a week, foregoing a whole day of business. So he chose to make less money so he can help people rest. And if we're honest, let's just be honest here for a second, we have a problem with this in America, right? right I, know, I know this because most of, in this, us, of us in this room are already thinking, you know what, we're talking about rest. And Pastor Bob, I want to rest, but I can't. That's what we say, I want to rest, but I can't. I want to rest, but I can't. Pastor Bob, you don't understand the pressure I have from my job, my school, my family. Everyone expects me to be at their beck and call 24-7. In fact, I got emails buzzing on my phone even now. I might even respond to one during your sermon. I got calendar reminders set for 12 noon. And don't get me started on the amount of text messages I have that that are expected to be responded to instantaneously. I want to rest, but I can't. Well, I hear you. In fact, this culture we've created in 21st century America, if we're honest, isn't really that healthy. And the rise of modern technology has only made this worse. In fact, Andy Crouch in his book, The TechWise Family, writes this. He says, true rest seems to be elusive for most Americans. Only one in seven adults, or 14%, set aside a day a week for rest. And on that one day a week, what do they do? Mostly, they work. Maybe you can resonate with that. I wonder how many 14% people we have out there today. See, at all stages of life, we feel this tension of, I want to rest, but I can't. The phone is always buzzing. It's calling to us like a, like a siren on the sea. If you're a teenager and you have homework to do, the schools even remind you online, you got extracurricular activities to do, and so you say, I want to rest, but I can't. If you're a college student, man, I read an article just recently that certain colleges are offering snooze rooms during your finals week. They're first come, they're first serve, and you can only rest for 30 minutes. And so you say, I want to rest, but I can't. Right? Single adults, man, everyone thinks you have a lot of time because you don't have a family, right? So they think you can work more hours. And so you say, I want to rest, but I can't. If you're a family with young kids, they always want your attention. They never sleep. Has anyone, anyone ever missed an appointment because they were just too busy? And so you say, I want to rest, but I can't. If you're a family with a teenager, your kids don't want your attention unless you have to drive them to one of the five activities they're involved in. And so you say, I want to rest, but I can't. If you're a mid-career person, your boss does not, will always want you to stay late. And you say, I want to rest, but I can't. And even if you're in retirement... I know some of you out there work harder than you did when you were working. And so you say, I want to rest, but I can't. See, at all stages of life, people are confronted with this, I want to rest, but I can't culture. And author Kevin DeYoung captures this beautifully in his book, Crazy Busy, a mercifully short book about a really big problem. This is what he writes. He says, you and I have a problem. Most mornings, we drag ourselves out of bed, start the day's routine, and hope against hope that we can simply hold our ground. Maybe we can keep the house in a mild state of disaster. Maybe we can break even on the to-do list. Maybe nobody will get sick. Maybe the inbox won't get any fuller. Maybe we won't sleep, fall asleep after lunch. Maybe, just maybe, we can get enough done in the next 18 hours to beat back the beast of busyness and live to see another day. And then he concludes this way. We wake up most days not trying to serve, just trying to survive. Have I sufficiently described the tension we all feel in our daily lives? See, as a result, most of us are feeling weary today, a bit weary. We need rest. And in the midst of our crazy, busy lives, Jesus comes to us and says, come to me, I will give you rest. What does he mean? Well, what I want to suggest to you today is that this is about something much more than sleep. What I want to suggest to you is about something much more than a day off or a vacation or a better calendar system, as important and good as those things may be. It's about something deeper. Do I have your attention? Why can't we rest? Three reasons. We love the yoke, we misread the law, and we scorn the Savior. 
We like the yoke, we misread the law, and we scorn the Savior. Point one, we like the yoke. Now, let me get something out of the way up front here. What I don't mean is an egg yolk. That is yellow, it is delicious, and it may or may not cause heart attacks depending on the yearly study that you read. No. No, I'm talking about Y-O-K-E, yolk. That was originally a pair of scales that you see up there that was used in the ancient Near East to designate a harness placed on an oxen. Later, it was used as a harness for slaves and became a metaphor for people who were subjects of a nation or king. It, it had the idea of a master-slave relationship. And so you say, Pastor Bob, why in the world would I like that? Well, let's read and find out. Look back at verse 28. Jesus says, come to me, all who labor and are heavy laden. Now, in this one verse, Jesus starts to get at the deeper meaning of the gospel. So the phrase, all who labor, can also be translated as weary. It refers to hard labor, and as a result, people are weary and burdened. And so Jesus says, all who are experiencing that, come, come to me. Now, if you've walked in this room today and you are weary, I suspect you have a burden of some kind. What is it? What is it that is causing you to lose sleep at night? Because there's two levels that Jesus is speaking about here. Number one, he is talking about the burden of the law and it's all its regulations. And that theme can be traced all the way back to chapter 5, and we'll come back to it in a minute. But secondly, this can mean all who are burdened with life's afflictions. And who among us doesn't have an affliction of some kind, right? See, in this context, Jesus is speaking to people who are fighting the anxieties of daily life as it relates to their situation as, as either poor or captives or they're engaging in idolatrous living. And as a result, they're waiting. They are longing for God's deliverance, for Messiah to be revealed. And what does Jesus say? He says, and I will give you rest. I will give you rest. He says, I know what you're walking through. I know your challenges. I know your burdens. Give them to me. Friends, we need to rest. Or we stop being effective. How many of us, let me ask you this, how many of us get enough sleep at night? Yeah, I, I can't even raise my hand all the time. Because if you're an adult, what I'm talking about is you get at least six hours of sleep a night. And for my birthday last year, my wife bought me a Fitbit. I have it on my wrist right here. I love when I wear this thing when I preach because by the end of the second sermon, I am crushing my step goal. Like, up here, I'm moving. <laughs> but here's the thing. What's interesting is the Fitbit can also track my sleep. It senses my movement and my heart rate, and it'll even give you a report that you can put on the app on your phone. It looks a little bit like this. If you have an app, you know. It breaks down how much time I was awake, or I was in REM sleep, or light sleep, or deep sleep. There's all these benchmarks you have to get. And when I wake up every morning, I am always amazed that I slept not as long as I thought I did. And when I don't sleep long enough, I feel it, right? So the bottom line is sleep is important. Depth of sleep is important if you want true rest. And rest is also important spiritually speaking. See, when we come to Jesus, we experience the rest of God. I wonder if we could get a Fitbit for our soul, See, so the writer of the Hebrews gets at this concept. Uh, after giving a history of Sabbath rest in the Old Testament, he writes this in chapter 4, verse 9 to 11. Uh, he says, So then there remains a Sabbath rest for the people of God. For whoever has entered God's rest has also rested from his works as God did from his. And that's the good news of the gospel because it's not about our works that save us. It's about the grace of God. It's the work that Christ has already done on our behalf. Therefore, we can rest. But is the writer merely talking about a day here? I mean, if we made it a discipline to take one day off during the week, would we really feel rested? Well, I think that would certainly help, but again, I think Jesus and the writer of the Hebrews here are getting at something deeper. They are talking about what I'll call the work behind, underneath the work. Because, you see, just because I'm not working doesn't really mean I'm resting. Well, what do I mean? Let me try to illustrate it this way. Is there any perfectionists out there? Yeah. You don't have to raise your hand. It's okay. You can just raise your hand in your mind. Um, <clears throat> I feel your pain because I've been through seasons with this issue. Because for somebody who, who wants to be, things to be per perfect, they can never rest. And so you say, man, I can't keep calm. I'm a, per I'm a perfectionist. What does that mean? 
If you're a preacher like me, there is always, 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 always more work, more trimming, more tweaking that can be done with your message. Now, if you're someone with the gift of hospitality, for instance, and you're a perfectionist, you can never truly relax because there's always more things you can do to get ready for your company. I mean, the house is clean, right? But you always notice that speck of dust, don't you? If you're a straight-A student, it's going to drive you crazy to get a B plus. So you're always working on your paper. You can never put it down. What am I getting at? I'm not saying, don't hear me, I'm not saying that work is bad. I am not saying that striving for excellence is bad. But I am saying that if you can never be satisfied enough to put it down, you will never truly rest. And so Jesus says, come to me, I will give you rest. And when the writer of the Hebrew says, there remains Sabbath rest for the people of God, what they're saying is this, put it down. Put it down. You're not perfect, and you don't have to be. Why? Because I was perfect for you, Jesus says. Stop trying to be me. Look at how Jesus continues in verse 29 and 30. He says this, take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and lowly in heart. And you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. See, instead, Jesus says, learn from me. Take my yoke upon you. I'll I'll give you rest for your souls. What, What is he saying here? Well, yoke in this context implies a personal relationship with Christ, listen to this, where we relinquish control over to him. In other words, we put aside our attempts at working for approval. We put them down. Dr. Tim Keller says it this way, the problem is not work. It is an absence of rest. Because you see, the work underneath the work, whether it's religious duty or secular drive, is ultimately about what? It's about us. You see, the reason the hospitable person tries to make the house perfect is why? Is so they can look good. The reason the straight-A student can never put the paper down is so they can look good. And yes, the reason the preacher can never put the sermon down is so they can look good to their people. And in our American performance-driven culture, this is such a temptation that comes at all of us. And that's why I say we like the yoke. Not Jesus' yoke, the yoke of the world. But when we try to make it about us, about our efforts, we're never really going to find rest. Now, I want to give you an image, again, to think about this week. When I was growing up, for the longest time, I really wanted a dog. Anybody out there dog lovers? Okay, sorry, cat lovers. Dog lovers, yes. I asked my parents, I said, Mom, Dad, can I have a dog? And, um, man, they told me no. For the longest time, they told me, eventually we got one, but for the longest time, they told me no, and eventually they said, you know what, instead of getting you a dog, we're going to get you a hamster. <laughs> Look like this, right? Anybody ever have a hamster? It's, 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 it's a rat, let's just be honest. It's a little rat-looking thing, okay? I said, Mom, can I have a dog? No, here's a rat. Uh, parents, don't do this to your kids. All right, so listen. If you have a hamster, you ever had a hamster, you know you had to go out and buy a hamster wheel because this little thing had to get exercise, right? You got it stuck in like a fish bowl and you got to put it in here. And, and what would happen is this, this hamster would get on here and they would run. And I was amazed every time they would get on there and they'd be running like, like for hours. Well, not for hours, but they'd run for a long time. And I would watch them go and go and go and I would start like yelling at this hamster. Like, I'd yell at them and say, don't you realize you're not going to get anywhere? Like, like, don't you know you're going to be exhausted? And they would just keep running and running and running. And then I realized they can't understand me, so I stopped doing that. But all I could think about as I watched this, this hamster do this thing was, how dumb is this animal? Like, it's stupid. You see where I'm going with this? So I started to think this week, Isn't that what we do with work, right? We're on the hamster wheel, and we just can't bring ourselves to get off. And friends, so this is what happens when we carry our own yoke and not the yoke of Jesus. Our yoke is heavy because we focus on the world's standards, but Jesus' yoke is light. And when we carry our own yoke, we're exhausted, but when we carry Jesus' yoke, we're energized. Why? 
because we've truly rested in Jesus. And when we rest in Jesus, it's like sleeping on the most amazing tempur mattress you could possibly buy. Friends, Jesus' way is easy because his way is the only way that works. Now, here's the thing. Here's, hang on, let me just dig into this tension for a little bit here. As much as we complain about being busy, here's what I think is, is really the truth. I think we love being busy. I think we love being busy. Which begs another question, why? Why does it feel so good when we get around another group of moms or of coworkers or of high school seniors and we have to tell them just how busy we are? It can be intoxicating, right? I think this directly ties into our crazy, busy culture because, again, underneath it all is the reason we don't rest. New York Times writer Tim Kreider wrote an article in 2012, and it was called The Busy Trap. This is what he writes, a part of the article. He says, busyness serves as a kind of existential reassurance, a hedge against emptiness. Obviously, your life cannot possibly be silly or trivial or meaningless if you are busy, completely booked, in demand every hour of the day. And what Kreider's getting at is this. We put a heavier yoke on our back so we can find meaning. In fact, one of the main reasons we don't rest is because in our society, people find their primary meaning in their work. I mean, isn't that the reason you took that promotion so you could work 16 hours a day? Yes, I understand. We live in New Jersey, and it's expensive to live here. I get it. But let me ask an honest question. I mean, at, at some point, does... Does there come a time when the money isn't worth it? When you're working so much you can't be with your family and at that point maybe it's really just about you finding your meaning. Or maybe you object and say, well, Pastor Bob, listen, I'm doing it for my kids. Right? I'm doing it for my kids. I, I want my kids to have the opportunity and not be left behind. Author Brian Kaplan notes that because of this mindset, our kids are suffering from what he coined second-hand stress. And he did a study on all these middle-class families in first world countries and asked them all these different things about their parents. And what he discovered, what he discovered was this, the biggest problem kids had with their parents was, what do you think? Anger management. And I said, why? (laughs) Could it be because we're so busy, we never rest, we're always stressed that we like the yoke? It gives us meaning even if others suffer. See, in reality, I think the reason we're so busy is because of pride. And Kevin DeYoung points this out in a chapter in his book entitled The Killer Peas. All of it stems from pride, he says. Why are you so busy? Here's a couple examples. He says, maybe it's people-pleasing. All right, we're so busy because we can never say no to people. Or we, or we like pats on the back. We're so busy because we love praise. Or it's about proving myself. Right, some of us never rest because we're trying to prove something to our parents or to our ex-boyfriend or girlfriend from 20 years ago or to that high school coach. Maybe it's pity. We want people to feel sorry for us when we are busy. We're posting. We love it when people see how busy we are through social media posts. See, Kevin DeYoung says it all comes back to pride. And the reason we put the yoke on ourselves is because we want to look good before other people. And we're still running on the hamster wheel. All right, that was the longest point. Uh, We like the yoke. But we like the yoke because of point number two. We misread the law. We misread the law. See, as you get into chapter 12, Jesus presents another contrast with the Pharisees. And this is how chapter 12 begins. At that time, Jesus went through the grain fields on the Sabbath. His disciples were hungry. And they began to pluck uh, heads of grain and to eat. Now, let's put this in modern day day illustration here. It's Sunday, and you're hungry. And you drive up to the nearest Chick-fil-A store, but it's closed. How many times has that happened? Instead, much to your chagrin, you have to go to the supermarket, and you have to go home, and you have to make something to eat. Your day is ruined. At least mine would be. This is what the disciples are doing. They're they're walking along in the grain field. Their stomachs are rumbling, and so they pick some grain to eat. But some people have a problem with this. Look at verse 2. It says, But when the Pharisees saw it, they said to him, Look, your disciples are doing what is not lawful on the Sabbath. 
Ah, the Pharisees, those religious people. And of course, they show up and notice something is wrong. You see, in this day, traveling or carrying loads or harvesting grain was forbidden on the Sabbath day because of the law. In fact, at that time, devout Jewish people would rather die than not obey the Sabbath. That, that was actually true during some of the revolutions. You see, the Pharisees, the Pharisees loved the yoke of the law. It was where they found their meaning and purpose. But don't miss this. The reason the Pharisees did this, and the reason many of us tend to do this as well, can be summed up in one phrase, self-justification. What I mean by that is that's what religious people do. They always try to justify their righteousness with their actions, and they often point out other people's faults. Why? So they can feel superior. We engage, when we engage in self-justification, we are misreading the law. I mean, have you ever met people like this? These are the people who love to name drop. They're the people who are always talking about how busy they are. It's a form of self-justification. When the Pharisees met, met people, this is, what I, this is how I imagine the conversation going. They would come up to somebody and say, Woo, man, I have been to the temple so many times today. Woo, I got my temple on. I am so tired. See, these are the people that are always trying to criticize you or prove you wrong. They're the busy people, and Jesus knows just how to handle them. Look, this is what he does. Verse 3. He said to them, Jesus, have you not read what David did when he was hungry? And those who were with him, how he entered the house of God and ate the bread of the presence, which was not lawful for him to eat, nor for those who were with him, but only for the priests. Now, I, <clears throat> I love, love, love Jesus' response here. Do you see what he's doing? He looks at the Pharisees and he says this. He says essentially, did you guys read the Bible? Because like, you see, the force of that phrase, have you not read, is meant to imply that they don't know what they're talking about. And so he gives this example of King David breaking the Sabbath, and the story is from 1 Samuel 21. Let me give you a quick summary. Essentially, David and his men are hungry, and so he goes into the tabernacle and asks for five loaves of bread. But he winds up taking 12 loaves of this consecrated bread that was meant for the priests. But David and his men were allowed to do this because they were really hungry like the disciples. And so Jesus' point here is this. If David and his men could break the Torah for the sake of hunger, well, certainly we can do that too. We don't need to be like all legalistic about this. I guess the Pharisees didn't get this part. In fact, in verses 9 to 14 of Matthew 12, there is another scene uh, that same day where Jesus encounters a man with a withered hand, and he heals him. And the Pharisees, again, try to catch him breaking Sabbath, and they ask, Jesus, is it lawful to heal on the Sabbath? And, of course, Jesus answers them with a question. He says, well, let me ask you this. If a sheep falls into a hole on the Sabbath, do you pull him out? And the answer, of course, is yes. And so Jesus says this. He says, of how much more value is a man than a sheep? So it is lawful to do good on the Sabbath. And then he said to the man, stretch out your hand, and the man stretched it out, and it was restored, healthy like the other one. Now, did you catch this? Jesus is taking the Pharisees back to school and showing them how they have misread the law. Didn't you read the assignment, he says? If you did, you missed the whole point. And as a result, you are trying to earn your salvation. You're putting your yoke on other people. Instead, Jesus says, people are more valuable than sheep, so do good. It's okay to do it on the Sabbath. The Pharisees misread the law, and the implications were great for how they lived. And we need to be careful, too. The reason we like the heavy yoke and the reason we can be legalistic about things is because we misread the law. But finally, the reason we don't truly rest is this, point three, we scorn the Savior. We scorn the Savior. Now, what, what does that mean? Well, let's go back to our story. Jesus has one more interchange with the Pharisees, and this final disagreement would lead to a revelation. Jesus says this in Matthew 12, 5, or again, have you not read in the law, there's that phrase again, how on the Sabbath the priests in the temple profane the Sabbath and are guiltless? Now, Jesus is using another type of argument here. What he's saying is this, you Pharisees are hypocrites, 
Because he's pointing out that the priests engage in temple duties on the Sabbath, which would have enraged the Pharisees. Jesus, don't you know these temple duties are an exception? But then Jesus drops the big reveal, and he says this in verse 6. I tell you, something greater than the temple is here. What? What does he mean? I mean, Jesus has been stirring up trouble all the way since chapter 5. Don't you remember back in Matthew 5, 20, Jesus said he didn't come to abolish the law and the prophets, but to what? But to fulfill them. And he's getting at the same idea here. He's saying that something new has come, something better, and you missed it, Pharisees. The reason you're so busy with your religious activities, the reason you find no rest is because you don't recognize who I am. You see, the Pharisees made two fatal errors. Number one, they misinterpreted the law. And number two, they refused to accept the reality of Jesus as Messiah. And so they scorned him. In other words, they had contempt for him. He's again contrasting religious people with people changed by the gospel of grace. And then he takes them even deeper in verse 7. He says this, And if you had known what it means, I desire mercy, not sacrifice, you would not have condemned the guiltless. Again, the Pharisees may have memorized the law, but they missed the point. They focused on sacrifice, not mercy. In other words, as Jesus said in the Sermon on the Mount, they were living outside in, not inside out. But there's a tension here. Because sacrifice isn't bad. In fact, Jesus spent all of chapter 10 telling us we need to sacrifice, we need to be prepared. Sacrifice isn't bad. But if you offer sacrifice with a wrong heart, without mercy in your heart, you miss the point. That's the tension there. But Jesus says, I'd rather have people who get mercy, because I want you to get it first. It's evident that their hearts have been changed. So if we bring this home, church, we can just say, listen, we live in a world that values sacrifice and not mercy. I mean, my goodness. Can we truly look at the state of things and say that our world is full of people of mercy? No. Everyone is out to get everyone else to shame everyone else. And we have to be very careful that doesn't spill over into the church because Jesus says, I desire mercy, not sacrifice. I desire mercy. We need to be people of mercy in a merciless world. Now, Jesus is quoting Hosea here, the prophet Hosea, and the word for mercy is the Hebrew word hesed. I love that word. It's a word that means loving kindness or mercy. It's all over the Bible. And the reason Jesus brings this up is to tell the Pharisees, hey, hey, you may have got the law right, but you missed the one thing that matters. You missed the love commandment. You missed the call to compassion that I have demonstrated all along here. And so if we ask ourselves a diagnostic question to us today, are we more like the Pharisees or like Jesus? Do we like to find the wrongs people do and point them out? Or do we, do we like to forgive and show mercy? Now, you see, for most of us that have been around the church for a long time, it's very easy to develop into a Pharisee. Why? Because we like to think we're better than other people. Naturally, it's the human heart's main condition. It's the reason we like to stay busy with all our activities. It's the reason we like to sacrifice with no mercy. Commentator Grant Osborne puts it this way. He says, mercy rather than legal observance is the heart of God's will. Now, at this point, many of us are saying, objection, Pastor Bob, listen, I am not doing this. I am a very merciful person, to which, of course, I would ask, are you trying to justify yourself with that objection? (laughs) You see, many times we fool ourselves into thinking that our religious activities justify us, but that is to miss the point in verse 8 where Jesus says this, for the Son of Man is the Lord of the Sabbath. And don't you see, Jesus has been leading us here all along. Masterful, masterful what he is. When Jesus says he is the Lord of the Sabbath, what he's saying is that something greater than the temple is here, yes, and what he's saying is this, the Sabbath law can be set aside when something better, when something greater comes along, and it's me. I am the one, he says, the Sabbath law points to. Rest in me. 
Is Jesus the Lord of your Sabbath? Because you see, some of us are so busy that what we, what we do is we wind up blocking Jesus out and say, Jesus, get out of here. I got this, Jesus. And when we do that, we're doing the exact same thing the Pharisees were doing. I can do this on my own. I don't need you. I'm going to work really hard. We make a big mistake because when we work harder, we think life is going to be better, but what we're actually doing is putting a heavier yoke on ourselves. All this work trying to earn approval from other people puts us back on this hamster wheel, right? We're like the little animal running and running and running. And the wheel keeps spinning and spinning and spinning and spinning. And what we realize is it's never going to stop. We're never going to get anywhere. What's going to happen is we're going to fall off broken and bruised and exhausted. Why? Because we are trying to do what Jesus did, what Jesus has already done. You see, Jesus Christ came to earth to accomplish something we could never do. We sinned. We broke the law. We didn't keep our part of the covenant, and so payment had to be made. Somebody had to die. And when Jesus Christ went to the cross, he, he took his last breath and he said this, It is finished. It is finished. The work is done. You can rest in me, so get off the hamster wheel. You see, church, this is what we need to hear today. We need to hear this. We have all kinds of temples we go to to make sacrifices. We have work, and we have activities, and we have causes, and we have even coffee. We, got sport. we have all different kinds of things we do. And what we need to hear today is this. Jesus is greater. That Jesus is greater than the temple, yes, but Jesus is greater than my educational pursuits. Jesus is greater than my romantic pursuits. Jesus is greater than my career pursuits, my financial pursuits, my, my social media pursuits. Jesus is greater than my kids, than my country, than my new car. Jesus is greater, and in only him can we find rest. Now, at this point, some of us are saying, okay, I get it. Listen, I've heard you mention this thing. I should rest in Jesus, okay? But what does that mean practically for me? Like, like how do I do rest? Like, how, how do I do it? How do I get it? Well, as we wrap up the message, I want to give you just a, a couple practical points. When speaking about Sabbath rest, Dr. Tim Cowart uh, says we need to learn the discipline of rest because it's a discipline. It's something we need to plan for if we want to do it well. And, and he distinguishes between what he calls inner disciplines and external disciplines. So here's, here's three inner disciplines for rest. Number one, we need to recognize the practice of Sabbath is still important. Because some of us are saying, listen, the Sabbath rest is that it's such an Old Testament thing. I don't need to do that. I'll sleep when Jesus comes back, right? Right. And everyone around you is suffering because you're grumpy, you're exhausted, and you're stressed all the time. Friends, God took a day off, and so can you. Number two, Sabbath rest is an act of liberation. And what, what Cowher means by this is that you find your identity in Christ. You don't, when you find it in Him, you don't need to find it in other things. Because your identity is not in your work. Thus, you are free to say no and not feel guilty. Jesus has liberated us to rest in him. Number three, Sabbath rest is an act of trust. Now, listen closely. Are you listen? Listen. You are not God, and neither am I. And the reason we don't rest often is because we have this God complex inside our hearts that we think we are the only ones who can accomplish anything. But I have to tell you, listen, if you've never heard this before, the world is going to continue on while you sleep. We don't rest because we think we're more important than we actually are. And we aren't trusting God to take care of us while we rest. Okay, so three internal disciplines. We have to get those in our heart it's inside out, right? So get those in your heart, and when those are deep in your heart, it leads to external disciplines. 
It's about the heart first. It's inside out, not outside in. So those internal inner disciplines will produce at least three external disciplines. Number one, take more Sabbath time. Take more Sabbath time. And you're saying, okay, Pastor Bob, now you're, now you're just telling me I can be lazy or I should be lazy. No. No, what I'm saying is you're probably working so much that if you discipline yourself to take more Sabbath time, you may actually be taking enough to rest. Number two, balance Sabbath time. What do I mean? Well, Sabbath doesn't simply mean that you go and watch your favorite show on Netflix for 16 hours a day. No, balance your time. Find something that actually gives you rest, like maybe you develop a hobby where you enjoy God's creation. Go hiking, go fishing, build something. I don't know what it is. Take some time to be inactive and connect with God. And this is so hard in our day of technology. We just can't be still anymore and really look inside our hearts. Don't just do one thing, balance your time. But finally, be accountable for Sabbath time. Now that final one is important. Is anyone holding you accountable for your rest? People hold us accountable for all kinds of things. How about rest? Now, I understand that sometimes jobs can be demanding and we may go through seasons of intense work, but, but it needs to stop at some point or people you love are going to be hurt. I'll give you a for example. A few years ago, I was working really, really hard. Things were hectic here at church and I was newly married and I told Amanda, this is going to be a season... It's going to be a season. It's not going to last forever. But after about a year or so of this, she sat me down and she looked me in the eye and she said, okay, remember what you said a year ago? Like, <laughs> it's time to rest. It's time to rest. If not, it will hurt our marriage and our family. We need accountability for Sabbath rest. Are you finding your rest outside of Jesus? Well, let me ask a deeper question here. Are, are you angry that you can only find rest in Jesus? Maybe you want to find rest in your achievements, and Jesus is threatening that. Well, if we do that, we actually scorn the Savior like the Pharisees. Remember, after Jesus heals the man with the withered hand, we see the true heart of the Pharisees in Matthew 12, 14. It says, but the Pharisees went out and conspired against him how to destroy him because of what he was teaching about Sabbath. And with that phrase, we begin the journey all the way to the cross. Because for the rest of the book of Matthew, there will be confrontations with the Pharisees. And they're going to conspire to kill him because Jesus is a threat. Rather than resting in him, they scorn him. They scorn the Savior. And here's the thing, church. We can do the same thing. It's what we've been talking about this whole message. We, we scorn the Savior by trying to be the Savior. You say, what do you mean? Well, when we're busy and when we're trying to work hard so that we can get some rest, what we're, what we're saying is that Jesus, saying to Jesus the same thing the Pharisees said, I got this. I got this, Jesus. I can do better than you. I'm going to work hard enough. I'm going to earn enough money so I can retire early. I'm going to organize my calendar so well so that I can rest. But Jesus says, no. No, I am the Lord of the Sabbath. My yoke is easy and my burden is light. Your yoke is heavy and you'll never get off that hamster wheel. I'd like to invite the worship team to come up. They have one more song for us. And as they do, let me just close with an image. A number of years ago, I went on a mission trip to Jamaica it was one of the most impactful moments of my young adult life. In fact, I saw God use me. I saw lives impacted. The whole week, we're witnessing door-to-door. -door, we're sharing the gospel. We're running VBS programs. We're doing construction. But there is one moment I will never forget about that trip. We took a day of rest. And on that day of rest, we went to a place called Duns River Falls. Maybe you've been there before. This is a freshwater river that runs from the mountains to the ocean. And you could feel the difference in the salt water and the fresh water. And I remember climbing up these, you can climb them up, climbing up these falls, I found a, a place underneath one of these little falls and had the fresh water run over my face. And at the end of the trip, 
After all the work had been done and this water was rushing over me, I heard the Lord say to me, just do you feel this? Do you feel this? This is what it's like to rest in me. Church, let the fresh water of the Savior wash over you as you rest in him. We scorn the Savior by trying to be the Savior, but we find rest by surrendering to the Savior. Come to me, all who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and lowly in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy, and my burden is light. Amen?